Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the M3 Market Update. My name is Melody Wright, and I do this show to give you context about the data we're getting out there uh, regarding the commercial and residential real estate markets amidst, amidst the backdrop of the global macro economy. Um, you know, I try to bring the micro 80 markets that I track each week with the macro, you know, interest rates, what's going on uh, in terms of employment, all of those different things, because it's interrelated. And if you look at one without the other, you're always going to be caught off guard. In many ways, uh, this, the, the way that we were during the great financial crisis at my company, where essentially we were looking at all of the, the, the industry economists and they led us completely astray. And so what I try to do here is give us, a, you know, a, a, a picture, a 360 view of what's happening out there. So welcome back. Today's show is going to be a little bit different. I'm going to try um, over the next several weeks to do a show at the beginning of the week that talks about any data that may have been published since our last taping, and then, you know, any interesting stories, as well as what we should be looking at, at in the week ahead. So welcome back. Thank you so much for joining me. Today is Tuesday, um, February 20th. We had a holiday yesterday, so I'm doing this show on a Tuesday in the future, we'll be doing these on Mondays unless there is a holiday. Okay, so just going to dive right, right in. Um, you know, first thing I want to talk about is a really interesting article that was published in the Financial Times uh, today called Bad Property Debt Exceeds Reserve at Largest U.S. Banks. And of course, this is around um, commercial real estate and this slow moving <laughs> disaster that we have been talking about. You know, I've been talking about on X Twitter for almost 18 months, more than that, honestly. Um, and many people have been talking about this for even longer than that because, you know, yes, did COVID, COVID accelerate all of this 100%, but we overbuilt. We overbuilt since the 80s. And, you know, the reckoning was always going to come. But folks were extending and pretending, a lot of people trying to stay alive till 25. Um, but this this crisis is going, <laughs> it's going to play out. It's just going to take some time. Although I think we are seeing an acceleration right now, especially with what happened at New York Community Bank. Um, and as we are getting articles like this, that perhaps even the big banks aren't reserve, don't have enough reserves. Now, what is a reserve? So essentially, if you just think about it, um, you're looking ahead at the future, you have an asset, and, and you can see maybe there are some rocky times ahead. And so you need to put some in the bank to make sure you have enough to cover your expenses in the future. And so that reserve is called your allowance for loan loss. Now, how you do that is you take a provision through your income statement to build up that reserve. Now, this article is arguing that the banks don't have enough reserves out there. Now, um, I had a couple of folks on Twitter kind of argue about what is enough, what's not enough. Look, guys, I don't care what number they had put in this article, it's not enough. And this has to do with the way that we are hyper-financialized, the way that debt is rehypothecated. Think the big short, think the casino scene, you know, where you're, you're trying to limit your exposure so you're selling that debt to other people who sell it to other people. It just goes on and on and on. And typically what will happen in these times of stress is that someone will have one of those bad debts. They, your counterparty, has not taken enough allowance. They don't have enough money. You suddenly are short because they can't pay you. And then at the same time that's happening, your asset is going down at value. And this is kind of the, the perfect storm. And so at the same time that you aren't getting paid on something, um, your assets are worth less, and so you can't borrow as much out there. And, you know, honestly, the, everything is about leverage. Everything is about debt. And so there just simply aren't enough reserves uh, to deal with what's coming for, the you know, in terms of this commercial real estate crisis. Now, that may sound, you know, pretty negative, but I just understanding the way these uh, lending facilities think about a big line of credit the way these things work, that the minute you need them the most, typically you're in dire straits and a, a covenant um, that's in that contract gets triggered and you are, you know, you're out there on the wire. It, it, and so uh, I don't know that we could say what number would be the right number, but I can tell you that more than likely 
especially this article uh, quoted Mr. Moynihan from Bank of America, and he knows very well that all he needs to do is sit and wait because he's done it before, um, you know, for the Fed to come in and bail him out. And so they're not going to take that pain. They're not going to do it. So anyway, uh, I am, that's my opinion, of course, but just having worked with all these guys, because back in the day, there was this thing called the consortium and it was the big five, uh, which included Bank of America and my company, you know, where we had to get together uh, weekly, almost daily at some points talking about all this, this different regulation we were coming under. And so I know these players pretty well, and I can tell you that, you know, they're not properly reserved no matter if they're meeting, um, you know, whatever regulations, because just like any test, you know, if you study the way the test is made um, or or you understand the test, you can pass it without having, you know, any real knowledge. So, okay. Uh, So great article. I'll put it in the show notes. I, uh, you know, encourage everybody to read that. Okay. What happened last week? Quickly, right? A lot happened. So we had a hotter um, CPI print, Everybody, you know, the markets went crazy just when everybody was, you know, baking in all these rate cuts. It was like, oh, wait a minute, maybe not. And it was all around something you and I talk about, you know, housing. It was all about owner's equivalent rent, um, uh, rents. And and there was a big debate out there on X Twitter. You know, to me, uh, I, I, I have, I don't have a ton of free time and I'm not going to spend my time, uh, you know, really talking about a made-up number uh, that, you know, economists manufacture. And and there's a lot of great um, folks out there who talk about this. Uh, You know, Rudy Havenstein is one of them. He just did a great um, podcast. I'll put that in the show notes as well, just in terms of, you know, how this doesn't reflect our reality. So I am certainly not going to get into debates about a made-up number um, because I think we can all – go into the grocery store or if we need a car or we need a place to live and we know that prices are not coming down fast enough. And I think that sometimes these debates are out there to distract us from what really matters. And the fundamentals are very clear. No matter what the Fed does, um, saving Main Street at this moment, the only way that would happen would be through fiscal stimulus, which as we've seen has all kinds of pretty awful unintended consequences. So, you know, and if, if you're interested, you know, make a comment, I'll give you a reference, but put it this way, rents are coming down. You know, you're seeing it more in your new leases. That's where, you know, uh, this may be a brand new apartment and, and it's a new lease versus, you know, you're kind of re-signing your lease. But you guys heard me uh, with Coffee and a Mike and he talked about how in Phoenix they reduced his rent. And so it's happening where it, when it shows up in these made up and when I say made up, I mean, they're modeled numbers with all kinds of assumptions when when it shows up there. I, I don't that that's not our concern, really, because the fundamentals are such that the pain uh, for the housing market for rent for housing prices is probably going to come before, you know, anyone else really r- realizes it on a mainstream media. And that's what we're kind of concern with. And, you know, I would say some industry analysts that I really respect, Ivy Zellman being one, you know, they don't see uh, as the same kind of trouble I see in rent because I don't think they under, they're not looking at um, all of the small private builders that went out there and in the bill for rent in the multifamily that they're not tracking. And so they track a lot of the national builders, but they don't, track those smaller regional private builders. And what I've seen on the road is just unbelievable amounts of inventory. You know, uh, one of my good colleagues, Kenny Cat PhD from X Twitter, did a wonderful analysis where he was just looking at housing units per capita that he shared with me privately. And guys, it I, it doesn't matter. <laughs> what has happened in some of these Sunbelt uh, states is just unbelievable in terms of the um, inventory and what they've built in terms of overall housing units. So there is going to be pain. Okay. Um, and so Ivy uh, Zillman, who I respect a lot, um, you know, she doesn't see maybe the bill for rent suffering as much as I think that they are going to we have also doubled the amount um, of single family 
that we have built for Built for Rent since 2020. Um, you know, the number was about 44,000 in 2020. Now it's like 85,000. And, and if that 85,000, no big deal, you say. But again, we're relying on a survey of construction when we look at that. As, and, and, you know, guys, I can tell you, I've, I've probably seen more than that already on the road. So why, you know, we know that respondents to surveys have gone down since the pandemic, but I, I, it's the fog of war and I think we'll understand better later. Okay. Quickly, I want to, I want to move to the MBA Mortgage Bankers Association applications. These are, this is a weekly number. This is for uh, mortgage applications. This is just you saying, Hey, I want a loan. Um, now, at the end of the year, everybody was hopping up and down with rates, uh, you know, going lower. Uh, now that they've risen again and and kind of sitting pretty sticky here, you don't hear it as much. Well, you're hearing. So they let me start. <laughs> everybody was getting real excited and thinking applications would go out there. And so you got all these headlines about, you know, applications were up. But really, when you dove into the numbers, you realized they really weren't at all. Um, so it kind of, you know, question whether rates being down was going to generate more actual interest in perhaps a mortgage, because, you know, I think a lot of what's transacting out there are folks that can pay all cash or, you know, they're getting help from their parents, that top 20 percent. And then the folks mortgage credit at this point is kind of at its lowest since the inception of that series, which was 2012. And so, you know, I had argued, are we going to see, maybe we're seeing applications, but are we going to see closed loans? Um, but we're even seeing, you know, kind of reductions in those applications. So for purchase is where you're going to go buy a home outright. Uh, your mortgage application, again, this is weekly, so we don't get too attached to any of this uh, until we can see a trend emerging. But weekly from a non-seasonally adjusted perspective, uh, it was up 4% week over week but down 12% year over year. Now that's non-seasonally adjusted. You know, I look at both uh, just because I want to just kind of see both sides, but I probably go toward the non-seasonally adjusted numbers more. But for seasonally adjusted, we were actually down 3% week over week. For the refis, um, this was down 2% week over week and down 12% year over year. They don't seasonally adjust these that I can tell. Uh, and that makes total sense because in reality, rates didn't go... <laughs> that low. Um, and so really, the P the only people that are going to be sort of applying for a refinance are going to be those that have a higher cost debt. And so not surprised to see those down a little bit. But I do think, you know, folks will be kind of tapping into that um, throughout the year, because I'm seeing it in my client book. So these are the books that I oversee, because I still work. Um, individual bankruptcies increase over 200% month over month. That was huge. And it was chapter sevens where they're just saying, okay, I'm done. Not even chapter 13s where you're, where you try to work through your debt. You, you the trustee decides what you're going to pay to your creditors. Um, and so the fact that people are just, they, they can't even do a chapter 13. That is very telling in and of itself. Um, and so f the consumer is in trouble and delinquency. And so you guys know that everything that we hear about delinquency out there is really delayed. Um, but it, I could tell you in my January books, it, there was significant increase in 30 and 60 day. Um, and so we are those and we'll see, we'll probably see a little catch up. And typically do we do seasonally when you get your taxes back or you get your bonus payments, but just saw an article that like Bar Barclays bonuses were down 43%. I mean, I think that we're not going to see too much of a correction in the spring for this. Uh, we did last year. Uh, mortgage got saved by that last year. Autos did not. So it'll be very interesting to see it this year. I don't think it's going to completely save it. Okay, so the next thing I want to turn to is that survey of construction. So this is where we get um, all the information around the builder's you know, um, how many people are trying to, to go to the county, get a permit to start a project, how many are actually putting a shovel in the ground, and then how many are getting completed. And this, all this information comes from a survey of construction. And, and so again, we know respondents are down. So this data in and of itself is always a bit questionable and they do a thing, they seasonally adjust it, um, as well and annualize it. And it, it makes it very confusing to track. And so, 
Um, you know, I, I like the non-seasonally adjusted numbers the most, but I'm going to give you kind of both, but it's a lot of information. But the funniest thing about this um, series is that all of the articles around this, uh, because essentially starts were down was because of the weather, <laughs> that it was cold all over the country. And so that delayed the starts. Now, that's funny. Travis and I were traveling during this time, and I can tell you it was absolutely cold, but there were plenty of construction crews in certain areas working. I think that the starts likely have more to do with funding and people running out of money uh, than the weather. But, you know, as uh, the folks over at Euro Dollar University, they there's many shows they do talking about when things get really bad, they always blame the weather. And so I think that that's a case, that's the case we have here. But your permit, so this is where you go and say, hey, I want, I'm thinking about building something. I need to buy, to record, uh, get a permit from the county. Um, those were actually up year over year, 8.6%, and you're seasonally adjusted. Um, and month over month, they were down 1.5%. So kind of a mixed picture there. Um, on your non-seasonally adjusted, they were up 11.58% um, year over year, and then up 7.44% month over month. So you know, I, I think permits, people, I think this has to do with stock market sentiment. I think every time people look out at the stock market and it's doing well, they think, oh, the economy's turning around. Even if they don't feel that way, they think they're the outlier. They think something's wrong with them. And so when sentiment, when the stock market keeps is up, sentiment improves. And that's why I think you have more people thinking, hey, maybe I can start this uh, project. And we've also seen a little bit of credit loosening around some of this because of capital that just needs to be deployed because it was sitting on the sidelines too long. Unfortunately, I think they're, you know, <clears throat> they probably should have sat a little longer. Uh, but that's a story for another day. Our starts, this is shovel in the ground. So this is where everybody was like, it's the weather, it's gold. Um, you know, if I can be out there, no, I'm just kidding. But um, starts year over year um, uh, for your seasonally adjusted down 0.7%, uh, month over month down 14.8%. So pretty significant. Um, and your non seasonally adjusted down 4% and year over year, and then month over month down 13.88%. Uh, so almost 14%. So very neg negative picture across the board for our starts. Now, completions were kind of interesting because we had that blowout last year, uh, at December, and I think that was all the builders trying to complete everything they possibly can to move that product because they'd made promises, you know, to the street. Um, and so they wanted to get that product completed and, and push it out there. And so what's interesting there, year over year completions were up 2.8%. This is a seasonally adjusted, but down 8% month over month. Non-seasonally adjusted, this is actually kind of comical. It was up 1.58% um, year over year, but down 35%, 35% month over month. And so that is a huge drop. Now, I have some theories on that. I won't share them right now, um, but we'll see how that kind of, what that trend is there. Now, that brings us to another data point we got last week, which was builder confidence. And so if you think about this series, um, you know, it's kind of zero to 100. Any number over 50 means things are, you know, pretty good. Obviously, as you get closer to 100, that's great. But anything below, not so great. And so the number came in at 48. Um, you know, th that's kind of where we were in August of 2023. But and it's better than last year, which was down at, at 35. But if you remember last year, everyone thought housing was done. Everybody thought the builders were done. It was really awful out there. I argued that there was demand. Folks weren't, because everybody just thought these rates, nobody's going to buy. Well, the builders figured it out. They'd already started uh, in June of last, in June of 2022 uh, with buy downs. They just, they realized, hey, this actually works. So they did the buy downs. They did the concessions. They did all that jazz. And they were able to really turn things around. And they had a lot of help in the media. Um, but I think, you know, sentiment has improved over the last three months. I think that largely has to do with the stock market. And if, you know, once people realize that perhaps maybe, you know, there aren't going to be rate cuts or not as soon as they thought they were going to be, uh, you know, I think we're going to see sentiment come back down and looking at the sales numbers in Florida, for instance, um, you know, I, I, 
it, there are people out there saying, uh, and we'll talk about this at the end of the show, we're going to get those sales numbers uh, in the next couple weeks, but there's a lot of people out there forecasting pretty strong. I would say in the cities I track, it's a mixed picture, but in Florida specifically, year over year down significantly, month over month down a little less. Um, but, you know, uh, it's going to be interesting to get those sales numbers and then see if, if we continue, you know, today the stock market is uh, waffling a bit. If we continue to see degradation there, you know, how that actually uh, kind of impacts builder confidence. Okay, um, the last sort of story that I want to talk about from last week, I was super excited. Um, you know, Bloomberg did a piece on Southwest Florida. You guys know I spent, you know, more than two months down there over the summer touring, looking around, getting depressed, just seeing all this inventory. Like, it was just unbelievable. You know, the numbers out of Fort Myers, Fort Lauderdale are just absolutely staggering. Um, but finally, Bloomberg published an article about how much inventory is coming online there and how prices there are dropping, uh, per, you know, of course, it's a headline. They said precipitously or something like that. Uh, but prices are dropping, guys, in Florida. I'm seeing it in the cities I track. It's happening to move that product. People are are waking up and they're reducing um, their price. And, you know, unfortunately, we're still early. This is early innings. And so uh, there are going to be a lot of people that get hurt uh, because people right now are taking sort of minimal price cuts but pretty soon it's going to take a much lar larger cut uh, to, to move your product. But I was super excited to, to see that story out there because finally someone in mainstream media was paying attention. Um, but just so you guys know, month over month and in, in sort of for the cities I track and I track 12 in Florida, uh, inventory was up 11.9%, 11.9% in a month, guys. And, it, and as we know, at the end of the year, it was creep, it was going up, 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 up. So this is still a huge, this is a, a huge number. And then year over year, up 22%. Okay, so I lied. One other story that I posted last week is about a particular servicer out there. They have $17.7 billion in servicing. It's called FCI Lender Services, and they are at a 35.9% overall delinquency rate right now. Um, so, so let me tell you a little bit about the servicer. They do a lot of non-QM or non-qualified mortgage. And what that is, is your DSCR, debt service coverage ratio loans, those business purpose loans that are not covered by the CFPB. Think about all those non-traditional products from the GFC. That's what non-QM is. Okay, so, so FCI services a lot of that. I've told you guys non-QM is at about a 5% delinquency rate right now. Um, but the other thing that FCI services are those private notes that I've talked to you a little bit about. Okay, that's where nobody is involved. Um, it's not tracked by any, no one is tracking it. And I think that there was a lot of these transactions we don't know about. Um, and I'd heard that from followers who are in this space. They gave me a lot of intelligence. But I think it's very telling that FCI has such a large delinquency number much larger than any of its peers. And so I think one of the themes of this year is going to be more and more information on this private note space. Okay, running longer than I meant to already, um, but just what's ahead this week, it's kind of a light data week, but we are going to get existing home sales on the 22nd. So, you know, make sure if you don't follow me on X Twitter, follow me there because I will definitely be tweeting about that. Um, I want to do some more work this week on my cities, uh, but I, I should have an indication in the next day or so about where I think those numbers are going to be. But I, I don't think they are as high as some are thinking. But, you know, we'll, what the problem with kind of the way I track it, I use Redfin. They use they, they have a combination of existing sales and new home sales, so I can't ever tell exactly um, but more to come on that and definitely check out on the 22nd when those numbers come out. Okay, guys, I hope you kind of enjoyed this new format. Uh, let me know in the comments. 
Um, you know, I, I'm going to try to do this every week, uh, and I, hopefully I'll be doing a show later in the week as well. No promises, but that's the plan right now. Um, as always, you can reach me at X Twitter at M3 underscore Melody, M-E-L-O-D-Y. I'm shadow banned right now because of an article I put out yesterday on Miami. I don't know, guys. It makes no sense. But that was a big article I didn't even tell you about, but it was about tech leaders leaving Miami, going back to San Francisco. But I've, I've been shadow banned. Uh, but you can still, if you just type M3 underscore Melody, you can still get me there um, on YouTube, M3 Melody um, and Substack, M3 Melody Substack. So I hope, you know, if you have a question, reach out to me. Best place to do that is probably on X Twitter. I'll see that first. Um, but thanks so much for joining me. As always, guys, hope you had a fantastic holiday weekend um, and a great week ahead. Talk to you soon. Bye.